six to get ready this morning. How many of you are hot? Perfect. It's summer. You should be. If I was through a winter, I would say, how many of you are cold? And you would about the same amount of hands, and I'd just say, perfect. You should be. It's winter. So, anyway, I'm glad you're here. It's great to see everybody here and uh, to be part of our uh, different sort of a service. Uh, it feels great to be outdoors, right? Uh, all these fans blowing in the shade. And, um, we have a, a, an opportunity to do something together today. And so a number of you, you're seated all over the place in here, but we're going to somehow make two groups. So, um, right down that way. So we're going to have half of you over here and half of you over here. Now here's the thing. Guess what we're going to do? We're going to play the telephone game. I know you're thinking, why did I come to this place this morning? Uh, We're going to play the telephone game today. And uh, so I need... uh, an. The, the thing is, you're going to play it if you're five years old and up, all right? Because that's what makes it fun. So uh, we're going to actually cut this group a little bit because uh, there's not quite as many people here on this side because of the tables over here. And there's a lot more over here. Um, so I need, let's see, we're going to have to ask you to stand up and you're going to form a line. All right, so move the chairs. You're going to form one line. Right on this side, one on this side. Just bear with me. There's a point to all this. I promise, okay? So if you're on this side, come over here, form a line, make a long line. Hey, Venus. Venus. I'm going to make you a judge. Yeah, you'd be over here. Yep. Okay. You're going to be a judge with Ryan. Okay. Okay. You guys did really well so far. That's awesome. Okay. So um, now here's the thing. Here's the way the rules go. Here's the way the rules go. Okay. Yeah, come on down. There we go. Here's the way the rules go. Um, okay, Lynn, are you the end of the line down there? Oh, you're in the middle down there? Okay, Dave, are you the end of the line down there? Are, are, you, uh, are you good at Pictionary? No. <laughs> Is Debbie better? No, okay, Dave, you're the end of the line. You're good at Pictionary. Okay, so, so the, here's the way that's going to go, okay? I have in my hand um, two clues, uh, one for each side. They're the same side. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to play the telephone game, and it's going to go from this one all the way around. Now, remember the rules. You may only say it one time, and it can't be loud enough for the person on the other side of them to hear. So you have to listen quietly or listen carefully. Okay? Uh, We're going to do it one time, and then what's going to have to happen is the person who's at the end over here. Okay, so... Yes. <laughs> Bob and Linda. Okay, yeah. Okay, yes. Okay, so you, uh, one of you is going to be the drawer. So, Bob, you want to be the drawer? You have to draw whatever is the very last thing that was said to you at the end of the telephone game. Okay? So, Dave, you have to draw whatever the last thing was that you have to say. Okay? And we're going to see how, caref- how, how close we get to the whole thing. Okay? So, that board, we're going to bring that board over here. All right. Now, you ready, guys? All right. Here we go. That is yours. You can hang on to that, but don't choke. Okay? All right. Blake, is there over here? Now remember, okay? Remember, say it slowly and carefully enough, but we got a long line. I cannot wait to see what gets drawn here, okay? So, uh, all right, whenever you're ready, you probably want to be quiet so you can hear, okay? All right? Go. You can only say it once.
we're going. The telephone game is afoot. It's going. You may want to pick up the pace a little bit. What's that? No. All right, we're halfway around. How's it coming? All right, we got it? All right, keep it going. We got a little ways to go here. I cannot wait to see what happens. <clears throat> okay. All right, this group has way more. Yeah, we may have to like cut some. Okay, I'm going to, Ethan, from your group, that direction. But Dave is still the end one, okay? Dave is still the drawer in the end, okay? So Ethan, your group, all the way. Bob, we're going to have to switch you. Carl, you're drawing, okay? Or Nathan. Nathan, you're drawing. Can you do that? Perfect. Okay, so Ethan, yeah, from your group around, if you guys can just go over there, because they're going to need more people. So just head on over, yeah. Unless, Bob, do you really want to draw? <laughs> okay, how far are we over here? Yeah, right. How far are we over here? Over this way? Oh, wow. We're doing pretty good over here. How are we coming? Oh, it's oh, okay, perfect. This will be interesting. What's that? No, you cannot. You cannot. We are getting close, getting close. Where are we at? On this side over here, where are we at? Okay, there we are. All right. Nathan, you need to be at the very end. Nathan, you need to be at the very end, right? Right there, all right. We're getting close. Oh, no, uh, Sammy, you don't have to go. Is he five yet, Nathan? Okay. Yes. Oh, I am. Okay. All right, we timed it just perfectly. Come on up, fellas. Let's draw this thing. We're going to have you draw. All right, yeah, you may seat. You may get seated. We're going to see how close we get to this. 
Uh, come on up, Nathan. All right, go ahead and grab a seat when you're done. Okay, uh, no cheating off the other person because I'm sure it's a very accurate. All right. Now, the one who gets it closest, the team that gets it closest, gets to go first for lunch. Okay? So just so you're aware of that, there is pressure. <laughs> you're going to be on that side now, Caleb. <laughs> and we have two illustrious judges. We have Ryan Bay over here, and we have Venus Matthews over here. And we're going to see how close we can get to the final thing. And then whichever team wins, we're going to find out what their secrets were for being so close to it. Nate's working really hard over here. I cannot wait to see this one. All right. That's as close as it got, right? <clears throat> It's good enough for government work. Okay, so we'll, uh, all right, and, okay, hey, Dave, you need to explain, why don't you come on up here and explain which one, what, what your answer was, because I'm sure people are going to need to know what this was. So, um, yes, now we're going to go ahead and set up onto the platform here and then turn it around so everybody can see it. Now, all right, so uh, let's start. Hey, hey uh, Dave, why don't you go ahead and answer, uh, what, what, what is this? Other than you're rather narcissistic to write, I love Groovy on here, but. Uh, <laughs> okay, so what, what did you write over here? Pigs fly. All right, let's see, what was this one over here? Band-Aid on a fence. Band-Aid on a fence. Band-Aid on a fence. Um, the, the actual answer, are you ready for this? The, 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 uh, the clues were the exact same thing. Um, let's see, who was the first one on this side? Blake, uh, Blake, why don't you tell us what, what, the, what the actual thing was? Big pigs can fly. Big pigs can fly. Now, I want to know what happened over here. I, uh, I really want to know. It might have been, it might have been, I bet third. Well, well, no, 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 actually, actually, I, I got, I got to tell you guys. Okay, so early on in the process, I walked over right over here and then right over there and I met on either side. That was right there. So by the time I got over here, they were still saying big pigs fly. So the fact that the, the, the reality that it went all the way down, that was very impressive. Now, uh, thank you guys. You may be seated. That's awesome. Nice job, guys. I did have, a, I, I did have one other clue for you guys to be able to do, but I decided after one we would call it. Um, but my second clue was going to be dogs dig holes for big bones. That was going to be the next one that you guys were going to do. I couldn't wait to see how that was going to turn out. What's the point? Why play the telephone game among respectable adults? You know, why, uh, why play the telephone game? What's that? How many of you have ever had to work with the people that you stood next to? I mean, you, for some of you, you were standing next to your spouse or your children. But you know what happened? It was important for the person on this end to work together with the person on that end all the way. You know what made you a team? Well, it was me. I forced you to be together. I get that. What actually made you act like a team, though? A desire to win, yeah. There was a, it was a common mission. The, the, the mission was take one phrase and go from this end to that end and keep it as close as possible. This team, 
That was a really good drawing of a Band-Aid on a fence, though. That's, that's very impressive, uh, actually very impressive. Uh, the fact that this team uh, got all the way over to Pig's Fly, that is uh, pretty amazing. But why did we do this? You know, it's interesting, as I was talking this past week, some of you are aware that I do uh, a sermon prep time with my dad, and, and I do with another pastor, and we work together on sermons. The one thing that we talked about this week was, so what? It was really the so what question. You see, I was prepared this week to be able to start talking about some, some practical handles of, okay, these are some ways that we can seek to build connection. Okay, These are some things that we can do to be able to say, okay, this is how I build connection. How, I can't build connection with everybody, so how do I build connections practically? Well, that's next week. Because as my dad and I talked, okay, my dad and I both, we're both pastors. My dad's been a pastor for almost 50 years. And his comment to me was, you know, John, if I wasn't a pastor, I'm not sure I would be this concerned about connection. Now, before I, I'm not throwing my dad under the bus here with a statement like that. My dad has been in the ministry many, many years, and he loves people. But here's the thing. My dad's an introvert. You know what? He doesn't need people. I'm an extrovert. I need people. In fact, we're going to talk about this next week a little bit, about how God has wired us differently. I need people. I need connections. But it's interesting, even my connections can be rather surfacey at times. My dad, as long as he has a couple people in his life, he doesn't need anybody else. How many of you here would be consider yourself introverts? A lot of people. A lot of people. <laughs> Look over here. A lot of people are introverts. The reality is, you don't need to connect. And here's the thing. When you come to a church and you have your few group of friends, you don't need any more. There's a lot of people who are extroverts. And we get to talking to everybody. And the problem is, yeah, exactly. We get to talking with everybody. But the problem is, is we only go surface level with a lot of people. A lot of them. And in fact, we never really get to that deeper point where it says, you know what, I feel like I'm a part of a team. When I come to Frontline Bible Church, I'm coming to my family, I'm coming to, to a group of people that I know cares about me, and they love me, and they want me to be here, and I want to see them. You know what, if I were to go around the room, I'm not going to ask you honestly, but I wonder how many of you actually feel that way about your church family. Thank you, Venus. There's some of you. But I, I'm not going to ask you to answer, Venus. But in, in reality, though, in reality, a lot of us struggle. And, and I think what we have to do is we have to recognize that the reason why we are doing this, the reason why we are actually talking about connection, the reason why we're pushing you to say we need to connect is because there is a mission. And there is a mission that we are called to accomplish. And if we don't accomplish our mission in our corner of the world, right here at 84th Street and 131, if we don't do our part, there are people who will not know Jesus Christ, experience Jesus Christ, love Jesus Christ, share, others, share with others about Jesus Christ. There will be a lack if we don't do our part. And so there's a mission that we have to be about, and that's what I want to talk about this morning. You see, the reality is I can't legislate connections. I can't come along and pass a law that says, if you're a part of Frontline Bible Church, you better start making connections, doggone it. And if not, you're out. And some of you would be like, man, I just really would rather not have had my last Sunday be an outdoor service Sunday. You see, I can't legislate it. It's got to come from within. And that's what I want to talk about today is really this, this mission that's within as I entitle my message, Making the Team. Making a team from here, from us here at the church. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Luke 9, verse 23. Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself 
and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. I want to read that again. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You know, it's interesting as I, as I read this, you know, it makes me think. Here was Jesus and he was walking around and he was going around and he was getting to know people and he had spent already about the first 30 years of his life up in a little podunk town up in northern Israel, a town called Nazareth. And he had grown up there and it was there that he had done his craftsmanship with his dad and whatever it was. And it was there that he lived. But then the day came where he was put into his purpose. At the age of 30, he entered his purpose. And his purpose was to be the high priest. It was to be that, that person for us. It was to lay down his life so that we may have life. That's why he did it. And so, but he didn't do this alone. He could have just gone and then gone all the way to Jerusalem and then done his thing on the cross and then left and said, okay, everybody, go. Go do the thing, okay? But instead, what does he do? He spends three years in which he takes a group of people and he says, and he, he invests in them and he works in them. But he tells them each this one thing. Follow me. He says, follow me. And as we're going to read through this, some of the stuff, I'll, I'll read some of these verses. You don't have to turn there. I'll give you the verses in case you're writing it down, but I'll just read these for you. Matthew chapter 4, 18 through 20. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. What does he say to them? Come. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. So they're fishermen, okay? They're out there fishing. They're tending their nets, probably repairing them, fixing them. Jesus walks up to them. Interestingly enough, this was not the first time he had seen them. He had already had interactions with them. But it was at this point that he goes up to them and he says, I'm going to give you one thing. I want you to leave what you're doing, and I want you to follow me. And at that point, what do you think it meant to follow Jesus? What do you think it meant? Start memorizing verses? Following Jesus didn't mean just, you know what, I'm going to go to eat at the same restaurant you do. Following Jesus didn't mean, well, I guess I've got to become a carpenter like you, or a stonemason, whatever it was. Oh, I, I guess I'm just going to have to, you know, move to Nazareth like you did. Follow him meant where Jesus went, they were to join him. That's what the word follow means. It means like an attendant. An attendant. It's like the person who's going along who has all of his entourage with him. I need you to go bring my bags over there. Okay, yes, sir. I'm right here. I'm an attendant. When he said, follow me, they knew exactly what it meant. As he goes on, okay, I'll read another one. Luke chapter 5, verse 27 and 28. Luke 5, 27, 28. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi, we also know him as Matthew, sitting in his tax booth. What does he say to him? He says, follow me. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. What did it mean when, G when Levi says, I'm, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, as a, ta as a tax collector? He says, I'm actually leaving behind being a tax collector and doing this. Followed him. John 10, 27 says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1. Paul himself says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Even Paul says, follow me. The, do you get the pattern here? The mission, the mission of the church really is to be followers of Jesus Christ. But somehow we've taken the mission and made the mission of the church be show up on a Sunday morning, listen to this word, we'll sing some songs, and then I go back to doing whatever I'm doing. The point of Christianity is not just coming here on a Sunday morning and being a part of an amazingly cool, crisp day here at Frontline Bible Church, right? Hey, it's not just about being warm or whatever. It really is. I'm giving up something. Why? Because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Here's what it meant. Okay, we talked about Matthew. Okay, what was Matthew? What was his profession? tax collector. There's another guy who was also on the team with Jesus, one of his 12. 
And his name was a man by the name of Simon. Now, there were two Simons. One, Simon Peter. There was another guy. His name was Simon the Zealot. Now, do you know what a zealot is? We would define a zealot as a terrorist, okay? That's really what you would define a zealot as. Somebody who says, I am so committed to this, I am willing to give my life for it. Now, the reason why I say zealot was like a terrorist is because that's really what this group was. They were a group known as the zealots. When we were over in Israel, we had a chance to learn about some of the zealots. And there were different groups, Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, and then there was another group. They were also known as the zealots. These people, if you've ever watched the, the new movie, Ben-Hur, or even probably the old one, I think it's Ben-Hur. I think it is, yeah. And in that movie, there was a group of people, and, and they started this revolution, really, in Israel, even though it's a fictional account. The person, if you remember the movie, the person that shot at Pontius Pilate as he was there, he was a part of a group called the Zealots. Now, why do I tell you about Simon the Zealot? The reason why. It's because Jesus went to Simon the Zealot. He said, Simon, I'm going to ask you to do something. I want you to follow me. Now, what did it mean for Simon the Zealot to follow Jesus? It meant that he was giving up his terrorist ways, which is what they were. They hated the Romans, and they hated any Jew who had sided themselves with the Romans. And frankly, it was a lot like a lot of Christians today. Rather than saying we're followers of Jesus, oh, I go to church and I do this, but I still look just like the world out there. Paul, if Jesus, Peter, everyone said, if you're going to be in this world, you're in it but not of it. And many people said, you know what, it's a lot easier if I just go along to get along. I'm just going to be a part of this group and I can still make money. And Like Matthew, he was a Jew, but he was a tax collector. He had sold his soul to the Romans. And Jesus goes to Matthew and he says, Matthew, I want you to follow me. And so sure enough, what does Matthew do? He follows him. He goes to Simon the Zealot and he says, I want you to follow me. And he says, follow you? I'd be glad to do that. Oh, wait a second. Does that mean I'm on the same team as that guy? I hate people like that guy. You're telling me that if I follow you, I got to work with that guy? Jesus, are you sure you know what you mean? That guy, he wants to kill me. He hates me. He hates people like me. He hates the fact that I was a part of something like that. Are you sure we are going to be on the same team with each other? And Jesus' comment was, it's not about the team with him. Simon, follow me. Follow me. That's what it's all about. You see, we become a team when we follow Christ. You see, following Christ makes us a team. Now, the reality is, I don't really like all the time the people on my team. But the fact that I'm a follower of Christ and the fact that you're a follower of Christ makes us a team. How do we become a team? Here's the thing. We have a common model. Who's our model? Our model for life is, is Jesus Christ what it is. Even Paul, he says, Paul, I, Paul says, I want you to follow me as I follow Christ. We recognize that not everything that Christ did, you know, Paul, or Christ was still under the law. He still would go to the synagogue. He would still do a lot of those things. He was a part of the thing. We're not doing that today. We follow Christ as Paul followed Christ, in which we're free from the law. We're free from a lot of those, those regulations and things that were, that were against us even. But we still are followers of Christ. And that is what makes us a team. We have a common model. We have a common purpose. Not only do we have our model, I want to be just like Christ. And I have to look at my own life and I say, how often do I pattern my life after his? But I have a common purpose. And that is to become just like Christ. That's my purpose. So when I look at my life and I say, okay, why does God take me through some of the things that he does? It's because he's doing this to make me just like Christ. Christ. So many of you have gone through some really hard stuff in your life, real challenges. It's made you who you are, but oftentimes Jesus has taken those experiences, both bad and good, and he weaves them together, and he's got a purpose, and the reality is he's trying to make you just like Christ. Why? Because you said when you became a Christian, you said, I'm no longer following John or no longer following yourself. I'm following Christ. 
That's what you said. And so Jesus says, I'm going to help you. And I'm going to take you through tough stuff. And I'm going to have you experience things. Why? Because it's going to be how you follow me. Not only do we have a common model or a common purpose, we have a common relationship. A common relationship. Because I have Christ living in me, and because you have Christ living in you, I have a common relationship, and I have a common relationship with you. No matter where I go in this world, if I meet somebody who has accepted Christ, we're brothers and we're sisters. That's the cool thing. You see, following Christ makes us a team. Now, you guys became a team over here when pigs fly. And you guys became a team over here when band-aids go on fences. You guys became a team simply because you were put there. You see, that's what Jesus did. He put you into a team. And the more we recognize that, the more we're going to say, I'm not against you just because you don't like the same music as I do or maybe use a different Bible translation as I do or maybe you dress differently than I do or live in a different place or whatever. It doesn't matter. You're a part of the same team. Why? Because you're a follower of Jesus Christ. So I want to I want to just make sure you get this. When it comes to making the team, we understand it comes because I follow Christ. And so my question to you this morning is this. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? And I don't want just the, the standard answer. Oh, yes, pastor, I know I'm a follower of Christ. I, you, you know I am. I want you to think for a second about your life over the last week. Does it look like you were following Christ? The way you spent your time. The things that came out of your mouth. What you thought about. Where you went. Who you talked to. I want you to think about that. Does it look like you're following Christ? Because see, this next point isn't going to matter as much if you're not following Christ. Now, before you make it feel like I'm trying to make you feel guilty or something, there's not a one of us who does this perfectly. Not a one of us can. But when it comes to your desire in your life, is your desire to look just like Jesus? Or is your desire to live your life as long as God gives it to you until the day when you get to reside in heaven or wherever it's at? You see, following Christ is really important. I was talking to somebody, talking to a couple people this past week, and I said, you know, sometimes as a pastor, it's frustrating. Sometimes I look at my own life and I fit this exact bill. Sometimes as a pastor, it's a little frustrating because I feel like sometimes I'm trying to make fat, overweight, overstuffed kids hungry. Haven't missed a meal in hours. You know what I mean? Got food coming out. You're just not hungry at all. And you come on a Sunday morning, and I try to say, and I try to say, we need to be connected because of this. Man, I am so full. I don't need another meal. What would happen if we all came on a Sunday morning because we had been following Christ passionately all week, and we were spent, and we were hungry because we hadn't been encouraged and now I show up on a Sunday morning and I'm starving for the Word of God and I'm starving for fellowship and I'm starving for this because I was actually using it all week long. And now I come together and it's like, I can't wait to be together with my family. But unfortunately, if we're not using it, we're just trying to cram one more meal in until it's like, I even filet mignon doesn't even sound good right now. I'm so full. Let me ask you, are you following Christ? Or are you a fat, overweight, overstuffed kid? I don't mean to be mean or whatever. I guess it's really what I felt the Spirit laying in my heart to say. Because you see, the next point is this. If, if the first one is following Christ makes us a team, the second point is this. Following Christ keeps us a team. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 15. 
Romans 15, verse 1. Romans 15 and verse 1. Here's what it says. Um, this is really in the context of, of the, the church getting together and judging each other. They were judging each other because one would eat this and the other wouldn't eat that. One would go there and the other one wouldn't go there. And th- there was no law against it that they couldn't do it. It was just that they were choosing to judge each other. So Paul says here in verse 15, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. I love this next part, verse 5. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you do what? Follow Christ Jesus. So that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why are we to be unified? So that with one heart and mouth we may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, why are we doing that? It's because we are following Jesus. So when I come together, it's my responsibility during the week to be feeding in my own life to be spending time in the Word, to be praying, to be developing my relationship with God. Why? Because as I am glorifying God the Father with my mouth, and then Daryl over here is doing it, and Barb's over here doing it, and James is over here, and we've got all these different people as we're all coming together. I'm glorifying God. You're glorifying God. You're glorifying. You're glorifying. As we're coming together, all of a sudden it's like, wow, we're together. We're a team in this thing. It's like going to a foreign country and hearing foreign languages around, and then you hear somebody who's speaking English. And you're like, I I heard my mother tongue. I heard somebody I can actually talk to. And so you're like drawn over here. I, I have to go because I'm hearing the language. That's the idea. So when I come together, I'm hearing all these voices all week long, all these voices that are not glorifying God, and yet I come together on Sunday morning, and sure, this person says it with a vibrato, and this person says it in the king's James is English. And this person says it over here in a low voice or in a kid's voice, whatever. But with one mouth, we glorify God together. Why? Because we're a team. But as I'm following Christ, and you're following Christ, it pulls us together. It keeps us as a team. And that's why Paul says, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus. You see, here's the reality. I need all of you to help me stay in the fight. And I don't say that lightly. I need you. You are my church family. And if I didn't have you, you know, I I don't know what my life would be like. And I know I've talked to many of you. You feel the same way. But picture with me what it would be like if this place, all of a sudden, became full of every single person following Christ on their own, passionately pursuing a relationship with Him, living the, not just to please themselves, but to please other people, and then we show up together on a Sunday morning. How would it look different? i got to tell you a couple stories. One story uh, is, uh, I was talking with, uh, with, with Dave Druby in the back, and Dave told me about when he had a chance to go to Cuba. He went to Cuba with a, uh, with a group of baseball players, and they went down to be able to do some workshop stuff and things with some of the people. They dig baseball down there, and they're really good at it. So he takes his group from Cornerstone down there. And in going down there, they had a chance to go to a church. While they were there, he was able to talk to this one young lady and with broken English and everything. But she related how she rides on a bus two and a half hours one way, to get to church to do children's ministry. 
and she was stoked about it. Nobody was twisting her arm. She couldn't wait to get there and do it. How many of you would ride two and a half hours to hear an amazing sermon by not me? How many of you would go two and a half hours to serve somebody else? You know, Dave's comment was, he said, I wish that I could have taken that and bottled it up and brought it back to America. I was talking to another guy this week. I don't know if he's here or Mark. I don't know if you're here. I was talking to Mark. Mark was a military guy. He spent about 13 years in the military going around. And he said, he said, the thing was, after going to different places, he said, I used to go to a town and then I would start looking in the phone book. What are the churches to go to? He said, I stopped doing that. He said, when I would go to a town, when I would go to a new place, he spent time in Italy, Florida, the, the UP, I forget all the different places was. But he said what he would do is he would start looking around and he would find somebody who was living their life out there for Jesus Christ. And then he would say, I want to go where you go. And he said, I ended up at some of the strangest churches. But he said, those people, they knew how to love. And he said, the, the, the church that blew his doors off was from a city up north called Marquette. He said, there was a church up there. He says, the preaching was horrible. The music very bad. The teaching, eh. It was the people. He says, these people, they loved each other. He said, I would run into somebody at the grocery store, and you know what they would say to me? Hey, how you doing? How can I pray for you? How can I encourage you? You see, they were living their faith. They were living it out. It wasn't because the preaching was amazing. It wasn't because the singing was amazing. It wasn't because of all that stuff. You know what it was? It was because the king was being the king. I, I, and that's the thing that this is like, if we're going to be a real church that connects, it's not going to come just because I say, oh, okay, I'll like them. Okay, I'll go spend time with them. All right, I'll get out of my comfort zone and go talk to them. Uh, you know what's going to make us a team? It's going to come because you're following Christ and you're following Christ and you're following Christ, and you're following Christ, and you're following Christ, and you're... And when all of us are following Christ, saying, God, have your way with my life, that's what's going to make us a team. You know why? Because I'm going to come on a Sunday morning, and I'm going to need encouragement. Especially if I failed this past week. How many of you have failed this past week? Yeah. Maybe your life didn't look just like Jesus. <laughs> Whether it's struggle, whether it's going through the hard times. I had a chance. I'm going to brag on my church family a little bit. I had a chance to go visit a family that was a part of our church for four years or so. This family was a part of the church, and then all of a sudden the church, this family went, Phew. we were left going, what in the world just happened? Um, maybe you've been a part of this church long enough to know that. And all of a sudden this family goes away. They don't go to church anymore. They don't go to church anywhere. I found out that this, one of the individuals was, was dying. So I had a chance to go visit him this past week. He was really cool. Because as I go there, I'm talking to them and I'm asking them, okay, so tell me what's going on. How are you doing? And they said, you know what? The thing is, we never didn't feel a part of this church family. I'm like, you haven't been here in years. He said, during this time, Frontline Bible Church called on us, prayed for us. We've actually had people from this church continue to bring us meals periodically. I'm like, we have? I didn't even know any of this stuff was going on. You know what it was? It was a recognition that just because they weren't attending here on a Sunday morning, they're still part of the team. And that was like, whoa. Connection, that's what makes a difference. And I know that people are going through hard times. And to feel like you've got a group of people who is here saying, you know what, oh sure, maybe you come from the different side of the tracks. Or maybe you like the Democrats or you like the Republicans. Or maybe whatever it is, I don't care what it is. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ and I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, 
we're on the same team. I'm going to encourage you. So my challenge to you, I was going to have you get into your groups again, but talk too much. My question was going to be to actually have you think through, what can we do? What are some things that we can do to be better connected as followers of Jesus Christ, as members of the same team? What are some of the things we can do? I would love for you to think about that. And I would love for you to bring your best. And I would love for you to say, you know what? I'm not going to be just an observer, just a seat taker. I'm going to be a part of the team. I'm going to be actually bringing something to the family. Because doggone it, this is my church family. And I'm going to make it one. I have a couple things. Just a couple suggestions that I have. Here are ways that you can be a follower of Jesus Christ and be part of the team. You see, in a couple weeks, we're going to be talking more about the City Fest thing. There's kind of a relaunch of it because it's coming up in September. I'm going to be asking some of you to start really praying again. Maybe you're like me. I had my group of my four people that I've been praying for, but life happens, and all of a sudden I wasn't praying for them as much as what I should. I'm going to ask you to start praying again for your unsaved people because this thing called City Fest is coming up. And as we start talking about this and start sharing about it, I would love for all of us to be like, you know what, I'm praying for my people too. I can't wait to see how God moves in the hearts to bring people to salvation. Here's another thing. I'm going to ask you guys. How many of you have a true phobia of praying out loud? Good. Then the rest of you, other than Rachel, can do this. I thank you, Rachel. I thank you. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you, as you're talking to somebody, it doesn't have to be today, but as you're talking to somebody, and they ask, and you ask them, hey, how you doing? And they say, oh, man, things are tough. You know, this is what's been going on. I'm going to ask that you stop right there. Dave is up here. Okay, so Dave says to me, you know what? I got this thing going. Hey, Dave, would you mind if I pray with you real quick? And Dave says, Sure. And then you just pray for him. Now I know for some of you would strike fear, panic in your brain to actually hear your voice coming out praying for another person. But I'm telling you, that would build connection here at Frontline Bible Church. Get out of your comfort zone. Be the family. Follow Jesus. Be hospitable and invite someone you don't know well over to your house. Some of you say, hey, I'd gladly take them to a restaurant. There's something about going to a house. Invite them over. Say, you know what? I want to get to know you. I don't know you that well. Come on over. Some of you are craving here at this church today. You're craving for somebody to reach out to you and say, can I get to know you better? If you've been a part of Frontline a long time, it's your job. It's your responsibility. Be hospitable. Invite somebody over. And the last one. I got an opportunity for a service project. Now, it's really not a service project. It's more of a fun project. How many of you have ever been tubing before? All right. Here's what we have going on. We're going to do a tubing trip. Here's what we need. Somebody to organize it. Now, the thing is, I guarantee that if we were to... Why? If we were to do a tubing trip, you're going to spend three to four hours, floating down a river, hearing the words, butts up, as you float over stuff, whatever it is, as you're going down the river, and you're going to be spending three, four hours next to somebody or a couple people that you probably don't know very well, and you're going to get to know them, and guess what? They're going to become like a family. We're going to do it. The problem is we just don't have anybody to organize it yet, and we don't even have a date yet. But if God lays it on your heart to say, you know what, we're going to do this. Why? Because it's going to be a part of how we connect in a family. Come and see me. You want to do it, Venus? All right. Uh, And here's the thing. When Venus talks about it, she's probably going to need to help a couple other people to help out. And then there's going to need to be this thing to say, you know what, maybe tubing ain't my thing. But I'm not going for the tubing. I'm going for connection. That's why we're doing it. So we're a family. We're a team. Let's build connection. I'm going to ask uh, Ryan to come on up as he's going to get ready for our final song. I invite you all to stick around. I know some of you have to go. I get that. But I invite you all to stick around. 
enjoy some family time, some fellowship time with your church family. We're going to have a, uh, um, we're making up some bubbles for the kids, uh, so we're going to be doing that. We're also going to probably have a game of Ultimate Frisbee going on in the, in the uh, coolness outside, so uh, if you can stick around for that, love to have you. But I want to pray for us, as just before I turn it over to Ryan, I want to pray for us that we would understand we're a team, we're a family, we need to act like it. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. Lord, it's challenging because I know I don't follow you well all the time. I get caught up in my own world, my own life, my own pursuits and activities. And, and sometimes I forget that I'm not just a Christian. I'm a follower of you. I pray that for every person here today, that, that they would recognize that they're not just the word Christian that dies and goes to heaven someday. They signed up to be a follower. May we deny ourselves. May we take up our crosses daily. May we reconnect as a church family. May we be that family that people look around and when they see us out in the world, they say, man, I want, a, I want a, a church like that. I want to go where they're going. May people see we're different here at Frontline Bible Church. So we love you. We thank you for who you are and all you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray and all those in agreement said, amen. Thank you.